start? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for showing up. Even though it's the last day of summit and probably the last or pre-last session that you're catching, so we appreciate you taking time with us. Um, my name is Dmitry Novakovsky. I'm a solutions architect at Mirantis EMEA. So here with me uh, today, my colleague Evgenia Schumacher, who is our partner integrations lead, and my <laughs> ex-colleague Maxim Datskowski, who is a uh, solutions engineer from HP Japan. What we will do today is we will do a sort of a follow-up session to the one which me and Evgenia did in Paris uh, last year. So uh, we'll talk about three things. Thing number one is we will describe what is the, uh, the overall idea of multi-hypervisor OpenStack. So when it might be useful, how it looks, why people are trying to do it, why people, why people are actually doing it. Then I will hand over to Evgenia, and what Evgenia will do is she will show you the reference architecture of uh, multi-hypervisor OpenStack installation, which we have been promoting and using with Mirage's product called Mirage's OpenStack. Uh, and also we will cover some aspects which we discussed uh, in Paris when there are certain limitations of what you can do with multi-hypervisor OpenStack and what constraints you had, what technologies you had to use inside uh, your environment to make it work. And eventually we will show you the beautiful pre-recorded demo. Yes, it's OpenStack Summit. It's, so I prefer to pre-record things. Sometimes it's like you cannot get to your environment or whatever, so we have it pre-recorded, and Max, Maxim will provide the commentary to it. Um, yes, I did the introductions already. So before we actually begin, I want to ask a couple of questions. So first, can you please raise your hand if you've seen our talk in Paris six months ago? Yay! Hi, Tedder. Uh, second, can you please raise your hand if you have something else than KVM in your environment, such as vSphere, such as Oracle VM? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's nice. And can you please raise your hand if you tried to integrate it with OpenStack or you want to integrate it with OpenStack? Oh, cool. Wow, amazing. Our marketing did a good job because <laughs> in Paris it was like, well, we don't care. Wow. So... <laughs> Multi-hypervisor OpenStack, what and why? So what? The idea is, I guess, pretty obvious to anyone who, is, who has been using OpenStack for some amount of time, right? We have the component called Nova, we have the component called Cinder, we have the component called Neutron, who are managing, obviously, uh, compute resources, storage resources, and networking resources. The idea of doing the multi-hypervisor OpenStack is to manage more than one type of hypervisors underneath single Nova installation and obviously providing uh, some facilities to tenants to distinguish which uh, hypervisor type they want to schedule the virtual machine to. Uh, the use cases, I mean, there are tons of them, but the, the, the ones which I've seen talking to customers over the last year about this and like the motivations why people are trying to do it. So first of all, first, first of all is the one which again, our marketing powerfully enabled, called enabling developers. Right, so many people today want to try to start trying OpenStack. They want uh, AWS-like experience in-house, despite of running VMware without VCAC or vCloud. And they want uh, their developers to be able to, at least for test environment, to leverage pro programmatic interfaces for building the infrastructure for the applications that developers develop. So in such case, the idea of running uh, OpenStack on top of VMware, it actually makes sense because if you have the existing VMware infrastructure, you can get OpenStack APIs running there and start and, and abstract it completely uh, behind OpenStack from, from the developers in your company. Uh, that's actually the story which VMware is heavily promoting with uh, this VIO product because the overall idea there is that you get OpenStack API on top of uh, existing VMware infrastructure and you can start doing these DevOps, agile kinds of things. Uh, second idea is to avoid vendor locking. So this is a typical scenario specifically for multi-hypervisor deployments and the idea here is that uh, when you run uh, your compute or even your storage infrastructure from single vendor. This means that at some point you might find yourself in a situation when scaling further uh, using this vendor's pricing becomes steep to you. So like vendor A may tell you, okay, now you have to pay me 
twice this year. We, we all know who that vendor was uh, during this couple of times. Uh, and the idea of multi-hypervisor OpenStack enables users, enables companies to uh, be in control of what infrastructure you will use underneath OpenStack API. And saying that, Mr. Vendor A, I'm happy that you want to make more money on me, but I mean, my developers are using OpenStack APIs. My portal is integrated via OpenStack. So if I want to scale further without you, I will just add KVM nodes on commodity hardware and it will just work and nobody will notice the difference. Of course they will, but that's the further discussion. And uh, doing the heterogeneous infrastructure in such way enables uh, company or infrastructure owner to be in control of uh, what decisions will be made in what infrastructure we will procure and, uh, and expose behind OpenStack APIs. And the third use case, which I also see quite frequently people talking about and deploying multi-hypervisor OpenStack for, is to support particular application needs. Because uh, there are still applications which we, in Paris, we called them classic. We didn't want to call them enterprise or legacy or whatever, we were calling them classic. And the idea was that these are the applications which are not very, I, I will actually speak about them a little bit later, but these are the applications which are what we call non-cloud workloads, but we also can call them traditional workloads. So the picture here, I mean, you can download slides later, uh, it basically summarizes the idea of what is the traditional workload, what is the cloud workload. And the point which I like here the most, <coughs> check one, two. It was mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> the point which I like here the most is the SLA. So the SLA of application uh, which is cloud ready does not depend on the availability of particular VM. The, the SLA of application which is traditional or legacy quite often depends on particular VM being not dead, being running, being responsible, uh, making, making sure the job is working. So that's, I mean, that's like an indicator of whether you can easily lose a VM or not. So typical web application, uh, three tier, right? So front end, back end worker using message queue and the data, replicated database layer in the, on the back, it's a cloud radio uh, workload. The application which expects your infrastructure to be able to keep it up and running or restart it very fast if the, if the VM died, this is not cloud radio application. Um, so what VMware, uh, what doing multi-hypervisor OpenStack Cloud uh, enables us here is it gives us the ability to use features from VMware such as HA, such as fault tolerance, and uh, apply these patterns actually to the workloads which are running on OpenStack. So you cre create a virtual machine uh, using OpenStack API or OpenStack UI Horizon, and with a number of tricks which we will show later, you can place it on the vSphere cluster which is HA enabled. And in such situation, if it happens, if one uh, HA cluster dies, uh, if one uh, ESXi node in HA cluster dies, uh, the virtual machine will be restored using the tools which VMware have beautifully developed over the last 15 years to keep the workloads alive. So this is kind of one of the ways to put, uh, this is one of the ways to bring your traditional or legacy workloads to OpenStack faster. Just connect OpenStack to an infrastructure which will be able to support VM SLA, unlike standard KVM deployment. Uh, in case any one of you is interested in kind of getting a good summary of cloud-ready applications versus non-cloud-ready applications and what are the design patterns for them, I highly recommend this book, Cloud Architecture Patterns by Bill Wilder. I, I was actually submitting the, the speaking proposal for Summit, but nobody wanted to see it, so you'll have to read it by your own. Otherwise, I would give you a 40-minute summary. So yeah, I highly recommend this one if you want to be able to clearly contrast and compare how to consult your customer or your user, how to develop uh, application in a cloud-ready manner. So the possible configs, the typical configurations which we see in uh, the discussion of uh, multi-hypervisors OpenStack are four ones. And uh, I mean, Sir Samuel is not very happy about the amount of Docker speech in this summit and in these keynotes. So I will start from the end. We can combine KVM and containers in the same OpenStack cloud, but we will not be talking about it here because you all probably have already seen your Docker talks 
in this summit. There, there, there have been just too many of them. So typical, uh, typical use case here is KVM plus vSphere. That's the one which we will focus, typical configuration. That's the one which we will focus for the rest of this presentation. Because vSphere, as I was saying, it enables many HA features. It enables many things which enterprise applications needs. And thanks to the effort which VMware has been doing over the last two years, uh, they have pretty decent drivers and pretty consistent configurations in AppStream. So that vendors like Mirantis, like Canonical, like Red Hat can easily leverage this. Uh, KVM plus, plus Zen, over the last year and a half in Mirandis, I've seen one customer who we've been discussing this with. They had Zen workload, they had workloads optimized for Zen. They were actually leveraging uh, PCI pass-through using Zen hypervisors, so they were passing cores from NVIDIA K2 directly into VM. Quite cool stuff. It's really rendering inside the VM. Uh, so. We were discussing the configuration with them of doing KVM plus Zen. We ended up doing two separate clouds because Zen has been, was tricky, tricky at that point to be combined with Neutron. So we had to do separate cloud with Neutron plus KVM and separate cloud with Zen plus Noma Network. And third use case, which we often also sometimes see in uh, the field, is combining KVM plus Oracle VM. The navigation here is quite simple. Oracle VM as a hypervisor is a solution for you to get a certified virtualized environment for Oracle applications, right? So if you, if you are running an OpenStack cloud, if you're transitioning your organization into using OpenStack as a main cloud management platform, if you have Oracle applications, many of them, I mean, perfectly, are perfectly capable to run in virtualized environment and Oracle even promoting it using Oracle VM. Uh, if you want to preserve the certified state and make sure that when you call Oracle for support, they will not be unhappy that you are running something on KVM or even on vSphere. Here is the option. You can combine Oracle VM and KVM on uh, the same OpenStack cloud and have the separate like availability zone based on Oracle VMs only. So yeah, and no containers this time, sorry folks. Um, with this, I would like to hand over to Evgenia to explain the typical reference architecture of uh, OpenStack plus VMware-based installations that we've been doing and supporting in our product over the last year and a half, I guess. Thank you, Dmitry. Can you hear me, guys? Good. Uh, yeah, as Dmitry mentioned, uh, we are going to focus mostly on VMware uh, plus KVM multi-hypervisor environments running uh, with OpenStack running on top of them. Uh, and uh, the reason is pretty simple. Most of the enterprise customers who actually decide to start the adoption of OpenStack, they are big VMware shops. So what they want to do as a first step is kind of get, uh, stay with their VMware um, environment and just to deploy OpenStack on top of it and manage everything through OpenStack APIs and then start adding um, KVM uh, resources there. So let's uh, take a look at this nice picture that actually uh, was stolen from one of VMware presentations and oh, just kind of <laughs> to, to just take a look and, and see what VMware uh, did for OpenStack, which drivers and plugins were written, uh, what and how we can use. So first of all, I start with Nova. We have a uh, uh, vCenter Cinder driver. As you know, guys, they used to be a ESXi driver. Now it's only vCenter. So the way it works, uh, the Nova Compute for vCenter is simply a, a proxy service that translates OpenStack API calls into vCenter API calls. And it gets connected not to a particular ESXi, but to vCenter cluster. So you can get all the things that uh, vCenter gives to you, like all the HA and all that stuff, right? So for Cinder and Glance, there is a VM VMDK driver. So you, uh, if you want to use vCenter, you have no other options. You have to use VMDK driver just to, to be able to have all those benefits from, uh, from, from vCenter and its, its functionality. And the most interesting part, I guess, it's uh, networking. So here you see uh, this picture, you see Neutron with NSX driver, though it's like NSX plugin. You guys probably saw uh, a presentation that Marcos uh, did on Monday about a uh, new NSX plugin that VMware team released. So now the picture will look a bit different, but still there is a plugin that uh, works well with all other stack of VMware solutions. So that's the kind of uh, the whole story around uh, OpenStack pro um, 
VMware products in OpenStack. Right, and let's get moved to uh, the way uh, multi-hypervised environment usually looks like. That's a very like high-level picture uh, of like what we usually, what our customers usually ask for. It what usually we suggest them. Uh, so we can say that there are there are two availability zones. In one we have uh, VMware compute resources. In another one we have KVM compute resources. So a user can decide in in which availability zone he wants to provision the VM, depending on a particular use case. It can be like, if you, it require more like production type of workload, definitely his, he will go to, to vCenter. If it's something more like dev testing, so it might go to KVM. And as Dmitry already mentioned, it all depends on the types of application you, you're going to run on your VM. So that's the very like high level picture you guys see. Uh, and um, what user gets, VMware is uh, for, for uh, virtual machines running on uh, vCenter, it's VMware ZHA, DRS, vMotion, and uh, in case uh, a customer is using an NSX, and you, you have NSX in your, um, in your company, which is pretty pricey, so guys, I assume you are very wealthy, so if you have it, um, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so if you have it, you can use all, all the benefits of commercial SDN solution, right? And uh, um, where's the catch? So I guess I can start, and Dmitry, you can kind of interrupt me anytime you want, okay? Uh, good. So as you might see in, at this, on this picture, you don't see any, like, any networking things. It's only about like, how they compute uh, resources organized, right? Uh, and all, the catch is always in, in networking. So uh, if we do a sort of like retrospective, we take a look at what we were discussing during our talk in Paris. We said that uh, the only like viable option that we had at that moment uh, that we could use in uh, environments with vCenter and KVM running there uh, was NSX. And in particular, NSX MH, which is multi-hypervisor version of NSX, and uh, you probably know there is an NSX V, which is a specific version of NSX for vCenter only. Uh, so that was the only option uh, with all like enterprise level features that commercial SDN provides, and the plugin written for OpenStack and, and supporting all the, all those features. Uh, so it's still working like that, and but not everyone wants to invest a lot into a very pricey, uh, very pricey solution. And uh, we are all like open stackers. So what we want, we want a sort of like open source option because we want this type of freedom that we can decide if we want to pay or if we don't want to pay. So uh, uh, this whole slide is based on our own like experience in Mirantis. So the next, the next line is Contrail. Uh, so why Contrail? Because there are two versions of Contrail. You know, guys, it's open, open Contrail, open source version of it, and uh, Juniper version of Contrail, which is, has commercial support. So right now, um, it's kind of, uh, it's not very easy to, to have the same level of functionality that NSX provides with Contrail. So Contrail yet supports CSXI only, not vCenter. Uh, so it's, Without vCenter functionality, you won't be able to get the HA and all these like enterprise features that people like when they use VMware. Um, so Contrail is not there yet, unfortunately, uh, but we assume that like in a couple of like months or maybe like half a year, we will see Six a lot to of nine months. Yeah, we will see a lot of traction because there is open source community there and people are really interested. And Nova Network, well, it's, a, it's always an option. You always can use, uh, instead of Neutron, Nova Network. And that's what we actually doing uh, for our customers now because we used to do that and we have this option even like in our distro. I don't want to promote Mirantis OpenStack, but yes, uh, when it comes to multi-hypervisor support, Nova Network is a kind of one of the most viable version, uh, options that you have. It works, but it has its own limitations. It's not Neutron, uh, so we can't give uh, to people what they need. And uh, 
the other thing that a lot of people have been asking about, and I know like Gabriel, for example, like back in, in October, we had a really interesting conversation in Budapest about like, hey, what's about DVS? Uh, is it working? Is there something? And um, actually, I guess that was one of the hottest topics because uh, having um, a driver or a plugin, I, I would say like ML2 driver in, uh, in Neutron for distributed virtual switch, which v vCenter uses, is a kind of thing that everybody is looking for because that if you have it, you can use open v switch for KVM resources and you can use distributed v switch for vCenter. Uh, so what's the state of art now? Um, Actually, there is a number of different DVS drivers available, uh, and surprisingly, like uh, you can you can just count and see the like one, two, three, like seven of them uh, with different types of um, different levels of implementation. Unfortunately, um, uh, the blueprint that was uh, created long back, like long time ago in 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 Neutron project, it, it seems like abandoned because nobody wants to own it. A lot of people trying to contribute, but it, we always get stuck. Uh, there are three types of implementation with their own limitation existing, and most of them, all of the code is available in GitHub, so you guys can go ahead and check it. We actually played with one of the implementation, and it worked with some limitations, of course. Uh, VMware team provides a DVS driver actually is a part of the NSX plugin, I guess, now. It's all on Stackforge. And um, just, in, just in case, mm -hmm. folks, uh, if you get the slides later, the, what, what is underlined, it's actually links to, just, to GitHub on part of particular driver. So you can go ahead and use any of these. Play with it if you're interested. Use ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, um, well, maybe it's not a very, like, community way of doing things, but we at Mirantis realized that we need to kind of move things to, in order to move things forward, we need to implement uh, another version of DVS ML2 driver for, um, for vCenter. So we actually implemented one uh, and we put it on Stackforge as well. So, and uh, the way we think we, we are going to use it and uh, later today, like Maxim will show you the demo with this driver installed and configured. And also, the, other, the last but not least, HP Helion, OVS uh, vApp option. Uh, I, I will let Maxim comment it on that, so if you guys are interested, you can uh, come later, like after the, after the talk, and Maxim will um, answer, answer to your questions. So all these options like, are available. Uh, they are not a part of like Neutron, but they are all on Stackforge, which means that they are upstreamed. So go ahead, feel free to use them. Uh, you don't. You don't uh, so the, the, key, the key here is that you don't get any of these other than uh, the VO driver out of the box. So if you install VO, you get the configuration, the option to configure the VO driver out of the box. If you install Mirage's OpenStack, today we have we don't yet ship the driver out of the box, but we will uh, in the next couple of months. But if you want to use it today, it's on Stackforge and it's tested against Mirage's OpenStack. So with Mirage's OpenStack, you can already get it and get it working just in semi-automated way. Thank you. And uh, I guess my part is done. So I will pass the ball to Maxim Actually, to show you. Not. No, to Dmitry. To Dmitry, oh, yes. sorry. Dmitry starts. Okay, so. You guys are gonna figure it out. So anyway, like I guess, um, if you have any questions about my part, I'll be happy to answer after the, we are done. Thanks. Yeah, we'll have some Q&A time in the end. So uh, what are we going to do today on the demo? Uh, on the screen right now, you see the environment which we have built and recorded demo on. So basically, it's a couple of hypervisors. Here I have two. Technically, there will be three, so Maxim will explain it. Uh, we have two vCenter clusters. We have one isolated, say, KVM node, all connected to the same switching. Uh, SXI nodes run DVS on them. KVM node runs OVS on them. We have Mirage's OpenStack 6.1 development release running on top. We have, the configured, we have configured two drivers underneath ML2 plugin for Neutron. So we have configured uh, DVS one from Mirantis, and we have config configured OVS one from uh, community. Uh, we also have put uh, HA proxy load balancer in front of them using uh, standard, uh, standard OpenStack uh, load balancer as a service. We have put both, uh, we have created two VMs 
every run, each of them running on different hypervisors, we can put them in the load balancing pool. So Maxim will show it slightly later. The demo scenario will be like this. We will create two VMs. Actually, they are already created, so we will not be going through them. And both VMs will sit in different availability zones, but in the same subnet. So one VM will go to VMware availability zone, one VM will go to KVM availability zone, but they will share the same subnet, so they will be, it's like, they will share a VLAN. Um, we will show that both VMs see each other so they can ping each other. We will show that uh, VMs are the, are the members of the same load balancer, load balancing pool. And what we did, we have configured both VMs to run uh, HTTP, HTTPD and expose a single simple web page uh, uh, which is showing it's like the host name of the VM. So what we will do is we will run a script which will pull on the load balancer VIP and you will sh see that at the same time both VMs are responding being act and acting as uh, members of the same load balancing pool. Um, yeah, I was told that non talks on non not any talks on summit are not good talks unless you show some config files. So here is the config file of my ML2 plugin on Neutron. But the only interesting part here is the only interesting part here is uh, the line mechanism drivers, which have two, which has two drivers enabled: VMware DVS and OpenVSwitch, and the section ML2 VMware, where you can see that my DVS driver will be talking to vCenter. Uh, using standard approach with hostname and API and so on. Yeah, by the way, the limitation which we have today on the DVS driver and which you need to be aware of if you are going to start experimenting with it is that we haven't yet implemented support for security groups. There are different approaches how this can be done. Uh, given how it works in VMware by default, we are seeing we're evaluating different ones. We don't want to put a VM and hairpin traffic through a VM which will be running on a, a ESXi cluster and kind of enforcing standard IP tables based rules. So we are looking for a solution to do security groups. So right now, if you will be installing this driver, security groups will work on OVS, on KVM nodes. They will not work on DVS, on ESXi nodes. So just track the development. We will, do, we will get this done in the next couple of months. So with this, I've shown you the config. I'm going to run the video, which Maxim will provide commentary to. And nobody sees the video yet, right? No, everyone sees the video. Very good. So, go ahead. Okay, uh, we have uh, two clusters. Come, come, come. We have uh, two uh, dif uh, different uh, type of hypervisors here. One is uh, VMware, we have two nodes here, and another one is uh, KVM with one node. Let's check uh, what instances we have here. So, uh, first one is a VMware instance uh, running on availability zone for vCenter. And another instance uh, running on KVM uh, uh, in Nova availability zone. They have the uh, same uh, subnet shared between them and uh, 14 IPs to reach them. So let's log in to KVM instance, and we will check. Uh, uh, we can ping from uh, KVM instance our VMware instance. So it's OK. And let's check uh, about uh, deep details. Um, uh, we're running trace route to check that we don't touch L3 agent or any router between them, so they're truly on the same subnet. Okay. Uh, also, we created uh, load balancer as service, and uh, we put uh, our nodes here. Load balancer using HA proxy with HTTP and round robin. Uh, Algorithm. Okay, uh, let's get uh, IP address of our uh, load balancer. Oh, and let's check uh, that we have uh, our virtual machines here inside uh, load balancer pool.
Okay, we've got our IP address, and let's log in to external uh, virtual machine to check uh, that we can reach our load balance. Okay, we can uh, get connectivity to them. Then we can run a script to check uh, uh, about load balancer. Okay, so we have a response from our two backends, one from KVM and another from VMware. And you run robbing algorithm, uh, they respond one each after one. Okay, Mitri, continue. Um, please. Just to make sure everyone understands what happens here. Each response is from different virtual machine. So you have, like for example, if it was a web tier of your application, you would be easily able to have front ends spawn spread across KVM nodes and DSXI nodes, and all sitting in the same subnet, uh, talking to each other, being exposed under the same load balancer. So that's like a heterogeneous, that's a use case number two, right? right? Avoid, avoiding, avoid, avoiding vendor lock-in and providing heterogeneous infrastructure. Um, yeah, so that's it with the demo. And what we will do now is we'll come back to the slides and do some summary. Yes, yes that's summary. So conclusions. Uh, Multi-hypervisor OpenStack today, it's A, possible, B, useful. So you can do it uh, with different hypervisors combined with KVM, and you can actually use it to do a number of things. Enable your developers, reduce the amount of money you spent on your proprietary infrastructure, um, and uh, also cater for different needs that, of applications that you have. So you can actually speed up the adoption of OpenStack in your organization. Uh, since Paris, I'm really glad to see that a number of companies, even though we did it not in, in a not very structured way, but a number of companies have actually contributed and made an effort to enable proper DVS programming from Neutron. So today there is a number of driver options. To, to try one, I will show the next slide, which, which, which one to, try to, which ones to try, start trying with. But it's not like it was six months ago when the only way to run multi-hypervisor with CSX would be to use uh, to use vSphere, uh, to use NSX. Uh, multi-hypervisor with Sphere to use it with NSX. It's not the case anymore. Now there are open source drivers. By Tokyo Summit, I believe that we will have two more gaps closed. So we will have the option to run with Contrail, which is quite a nice SDN, which is directly competing with NSX, but which, which is lacking some features today. And one of them is multi-hypervisor. And in the Mirage's driver, we'll solve security groups by that time. And I believe that we will also start shipping it with Mirage's OpenStack distribution, so it will be completely out-of-the-box solution. How to get this, all, this whole goodness today? Three options. Either get Mirage's OpenStack. You can then download it for, with 30 days free trial from our site and use the uh, guides which are on GitHub how to install DVS driver on top. You can also take Vio. Vio is very nice. I mean, I've seen the demos, the design work, the UX of installation is very nice. And I mean, if you plan to run not actually multi-hypervisor, but OpenStack on top of VMware, that's a great option. So it's not really multi-hypervisor, but it's, will, it will cater for, your, for a couple of use cases as well to enable developers and to get OpenStack running on top of VMware. And of course, if you feel in adventures, you can get into do it yourself. So, I mean, all the drivers are up there in the Neutron. You can go ahead and configure them. Usually, it's a couple of lines. Just make sure that you configure not only Nova and Neutron, but also Cinder and Glance, looking at the MDKs. Um, that's it with the slide where. Let's open up for questions. Do we still have time? I believe we have about seven minutes. So, any questions? Everyone wants oh. to go home and drink Please. some beer. Please. Dima, hmm? here's oh, the here. question. Um, the PPL for Nova was talking about how the drivers were moved out and then they may be moved back in. What is the significance of that to someone who hasn't started yet using OpenStack? Well, uh, 
in terms of Nova, it's actually hard for me to comment. I haven't heard of any drivers, at least of those which I've been listing here, like from VMware side, being moved out. The significance is obvious. I mean, if you configure your OpenStack Cloud to use, if you, if you would have configured your OpenStack Cloud to use old uh, Citrix's ESXi driver a couple of years ago, and now it would be deprecated, you would have a migration effort to transition into the new driver, which is from VMware. I don't expect VMware driver to get anywhere out of OpenStack, given the level of contribution of the company. So I don't, I don't think it's a risk of introducing it today. In terms of Neutron, well, Neutron is more dynamic, but again, the ML2 abstraction layer is uh, there, and I don't think it will go anywhere. So again, if you invest into building out the cloud using Mirage's driver today, for example, uh, there is certain risk because we haven't yet upstreamed the driver. So yes, only us are de to depend on, on uh, keeping it running. But it's uh, open source, it's in GitHub, so worst case, if we go somewhere and decide not to maintain it anymore, you can maintain it by yourself. The API is quite, is quite stable over there, so it's not like it's a huge effort to bring it to the new version of OpenStack. What about IPv6 support? That's a very good question. Evgenia, what about IPv6 support? No such plans so far. So it's a, so, yeah. it's a very good question, but uh, I guess the same question actually um, uh, was asked uh, during the session that VMware team did. So it was like, not yet. Yeah, like we even don't look at it. Well, I mean, business-wise, obviously for every company, the investment into developing this driver or that driver is like something that is being checked against attraction on the market, right? So today we have some deployments which we are doing the, in, in such manner. Later, if people will be asking for IPv6 and being ready to pay for it, we will do it. Okay? Okay.